Thank you guys for sticking through this. So we're going to go over this quickly and you know, you've heard a lot of this, so I'm just going to try and put this together. And the idea here was I was asked to talk about choosing the right treatment for your myeloma. And I'm not sure that we're going to come up with an answer right now. I think the important thing for you all to know is there's a lot out there and there's a lot to choose from. So we are in a happy place because we have choices. I will tell you that 15 and 20 years back, we did not have those choices. And, you know, the discussion in the clinic was pretty straightforward. Not so. So it's it's almost like you're in a candy store and how can you choose from. And end of the day, I will tell you that it doesn't matter what your myeloma is all about. At some point in time in your life, you are going to see all of these treatments. So whether you get it at the outset or you get it at the back end, it really doesn't matter. And that's the kind of decision which your doctor and your team and with you in mind is going to be able to make. We talked a little bit about myeloma. You all know that it's uh, not that uncommon a disease. And I know patients tell me all of all the all the time, that before they were ever diagnosed with myeloma, they'd never heard of myeloma, and at that time they used to call it melanoma, not myeloma. And once you're diagnosed, you actually meet people with myeloma, and you realize that it's not un that uncommon. And at any given time, you have about 100,000 patients living with myeloma. We talked about all the diagnostics, so we're not going to go into that. So what's happened, as you've heard all day today, is the diagnostics have improved. We are getting better at understanding the disease. What's also happened is we have all of these FDA-approved drugs in myeloma. So we have the proteasome inhibitors, bortezomib, carfilzomib, ixazomib. You have the imids. You have uh, pal and lidomide palmalidomide, then you have doxyl with bortezomib, panobinostat is an HDAC inhibitor, the monoclonal antibodies is something which Faith just talked about, elotuzumab and deritumumab, and high-dose melflan has been around for many years now. It's been around for close to um, 40 years where we've been using high-dose chemotherapy for myeloma. And with all of this, the question then becomes, because of the choices and because in general, the treatments we have available to us today are well tolerated as long as we can adjust them. The question becomes, should we be treating asymptomatic myeloma? And you know, I know Faith asked earlier on, I don't think anybody in this group has smoldering myeloma. But what we know about our disease is that there is a precursor disease state. So you heard this morning about MGUS, you heard this morning about smoldering myeloma. And when you think about curing a disease, and that's something we're thinking of in uh, what we do in the lab laboratory as well as in the clinic is it makes sense to treat a disease early so that you prevent it from becoming as complicated as it is as we are talking about. So because we have this smoldering myeloma situation, you know, what happens with people with smoldering myeloma, what we have been able to do is identify certain risk factors which predispose them to developing myeloma. So that we refer to as high-risk smoldering myeloma. What we are actually doing, and again, Faith talked about this, we are vaccinating these folks because wouldn't it be nice to actually vaccinate you against, it's like getting the flu shot and not getting the flu, get a myeloma shot and hopefully not get myeloma. Again, I will tell you that this is very early in development, but what we are doing at my center is a peptide vaccine where we've gotten a bunch of proteins together in this vaccine. We give it to patients. It's six doses of this vaccine are given. We've treated about 20 patients with this, and obviously we're going to have to wait and see whether it's worked or not. What we do know is patients actually do mount an immune response. And when you see these red cells there, it tells you that these are memory T cells which can recognize myeloma as foreign, and hopefully these memory T cells are going to persist and not end up causing myeloma in those patients. So the vaccine which we were talking about is here in clinic. It's got a lot of room to improve and develop, and it's going to be a few years before uh, people can actually get it. But this is something we are absolutely thinking about. And the other thing is, you know, we talk, there's a lot of things we can talk about in what's best, what's not best, et cetera, for treatment. But I think if you follow certain principles, 
in terms of what is it that you need to do to take care of myeloma. And typically, most times when I see somebody with myeloma in my clinic, uh, the first question I kind of ask myself is, is this somebody who I would consider for a transplant? Is this somebody I wouldn't consider for a transplant? And that, uh, the, within that question comes what are the other features which a patient has which pushes me in one direction versus not? What are the preferences of my patient? What would he like to do? And I think we're in a place now where we can pick and choose. There are folks who don't want to come to the clinic to get intravenous treatment all the time. We have an oral alternative and things like that. So all of those things come into play and we generally start with some form of treatment wherein we try and control the disease first. We either use a transplant to consolidate that response and then we either continue treatment or we maintain treatment. We talked a little bit about supportive care in the morning and a lot of you have bone disease associated with your myeloma and it's important to take care of that throughout the course of your myeloma. You've seen this already, and the good news is with the combinations that we have, we are getting to a 100% response rate. And this I'm going to go over really quickly. We Should we be treating for MRD negativity as the goal? And obviously, because we have this test now, the future of myeloma would be this. But right now, I do not think it's standard practice. So clinical trials are aiming to get you to MRD negativity. And the reason to do that is we know that if you are MRD negative, you are going to do better than being MRD positive. And that's not really rocket science, right? It's like if you have a better response, you are going to do better. And the only thing which MRD is teaching us right now is MRD is a tool which allows us to get to a very sensitive level of figuring out that you don't have the disease. And the reason why we're doing all of this research is even with everything we have today, the rate of MRD negativity is about 50% in people. And there is room for us to keep doing better. And that's why we ask for those samples. That's why we're doing all the genetic studies with Gareth is doing. And that's where we're going to learn to try and deepen those responses in people. You've seen this slide already. This was a, a trial for younger people, and the, this is a trial for patients who, um, you know, the question which was asked was, okay, you have all of these wonderful new drugs in myeloma. Do you still need to do a transplant in the context of these wonderful new drugs? So we did design this trial asking that patients will get these novel new drugs and then with or without a transplant, and does that transplant make a difference? And what we found there was the uh, fact that patients who got the transplant had a better remission and deeper remission, which lasted longer. What we still have not shown even today, and for those of you who've opted for not getting a transplant, I want you all to know this, is we've never shown that if you didn't get a transplant, you didn't live long enough. That's not been shown. So the key is that, yes, you have to view transplant as a modality of treatment. This helps deepen your responses, but there's other ways of doing it as well. The other thing which we have learned of in the last several years is in myeloma, at least, the one thing for sure is continuing on treatment makes a difference. So either continuous treatment or maintenance treatment is really important. And even if you, it's not about how quickly you get to that good response or MRD negative state. Some people take a long time to get there, and that's why staying on drugs like Revlimid maintenance that response can keep deepening. And even if you're not MRD negative at four months, you can become that at one year and so on and so forth. So the depth of response is related to how long you stay on treatment. So the other thing, the other question which was asked over the last few years was, should you be doing two drugs or three drugs? And the reason to ask this question was we had the ability to be able to combine these drugs. And this was a trial which was done as a cooperative group trial, more than 500 patients 
comparing lenalidomide to dexamethasone versus the triplet, which is generally the accepted treatment now, which is VRD or RVD, Revlimid, Velcade, and Dexamethasone, and then followed by maintenance. And what this trial has shown very nicely is that when you get the triplet, you're going to do better, and you also live longer. So in general, if you are able to tolerate treatment, you should be getting three drugs. There are certainly patients in my practice where if the risk of being on those three drugs is too high, we will sometimes use two drugs and expose the third drugs later, later on. So that does happen. But in general, three drugs is what we would uh, recommend. Uh, you know, myeloma tends to be a disease of slightly older people. They're not all transplant eligible. The majority of myeloma is 60 five plus. The common age for 65 plus is most myeloma, 68, 69, 70 plus. And transplant can be quite hard on those folks. What we are using is RVD, but we're using a lighter regimen, so a modified RVD regimen. Extremely well tolerated in people. I have somebody who's 92 years old on this treatment and doing well. So the other critical thing to remember for all of you is even if you combine these drugs, there is room to adjust the doses of these medicines. We give the Velcade, for example, weekly. We give it subcutaneously, although the recommended dose of Revlimid is 25. Very few people above the age of 70 actually tolerate that 25 milligrams of Revlimid, and it's okay to dial down and okay to use a lower dose. Dexamethasone, I think the hardest thing which most patients will talk about is, you know, you're fine with your Revlimid, you're fine with your Bortezomib, but when it comes to the Decadron, you know, that can be quite a challenge. And that's the one drug which I do modify quite quickly. So there's lots of room to go up or down on Revlim, uh, dexamethasone. There's ways of tapering down that dexamethasone so you're able to tolerate it a whole lot better. So I just want to show you a lot of, you know, this is just a list of all the trials. I don't think you need to go into it. But suffice to say that triplet combinations are working out to be better. There's a whole bunch of ongoing trials that we are doing in the research setting. You heard about monoclonal antibiotics antibodies. So in the upfront, so these are all approved when the disease comes back. What we are now studying is these monoclonal antibodies in the early at the time of diagnosis. We'll have to wait and see how this data uh, kind of uh, shakes out. So I think what we know is triplet combinations should be used. There are certain situations where I will not use RVD. And one of those situations is when patients present with kidney failure. So if you present with kidney failure, the treatment of choice would be using cytoxan. It's a chemotherapy. You combine that with bortezomib and dexamethasone. There are ongoing trials looking at the other proteasome inhibitor, which is carfilzomib, so KRD, carfilzomib, lenalidomide, dexamethasone, that is being studied as we speak. So obviously what I have told you right now is three drugs are good, and three drugs should be what should be done in the majority of patients. So the next question is, okay, if three drugs are good, can I do four drugs, right? So more is not always better. There was a trial where we did do the fourth drug. We added in cytoxan. This was called the evolution trial, CRVD, and we found that there was way more toxicity when you combined the fourth drug. So CRVD was certainly not the best combination. We are looking at these four drug combinations again, and we think we can still study them because the monoclonal antibodies that you just heard about are actually drugs which are generally well tolerated, and maybe when they're paired with this, patients are going to do well. So this is ongoing work. We'll see how that works out. Out. But what ends up happening the majority of times is myeloma does come back. And typically what's happening is it comes back after four or five years or so on an average if you've been on maintenance. And with every myeloma relapse coming back, that remission can be a little bit harder for us to uh, treat. And then the question becomes, what do you do in that situation? 
And you know, I've talked a lot about CR, getting into the best possible response, getting to that MRD negative st status should be generally the goal. But remember that not all patients get there and everybody's disease is very different. So that even if you get somewhat of a response, that's gonna help benefit your disease. It's controlling your disease to some level. And this is gonna help prevent you from going on to your next line of treatment. So these things, any kind of response is a good response. To try and get the best possible response obviously should be the goal. The other question to ask, and we get this all the time at relapse, specifically at relapse, when should I start treatment when my disease is becoming active again? What is the number that you're gonna treat me at? What level of the monoclonal protein you want it to be? Where should my light chains be? And really the big question that I think we have to ask ourselves is, does this patient of mine need treatment right now? So that if your monoclonal protein, which was zero, suddenly becomes 0.1, do I suddenly need to go and start treating? And the answer to that is no. And again, you know, everybody's relapse is a little bit different, which is why I say myeloma is a whole bunch of diseases and every patient's disease is a little bit different. I think it's really critical to figure out when that disease comes back, is that disease causing trouble? Is it causing more bone problems? Is it at a risk of causing more kidney damage? If those things are happening, you know, there's no argument. Of course you need to treat it. But because we are following all of you so closely, most times we pick up disease on blood work and not every blip in your blood work needs treatment. I think that's something which is really important for everybody to understand and we refer to that as biochemical relapse. If it's a clinical relapse with kind of complications, of course, treat it. But biochemical relapse, you can wait and watch, you can try and get a sense of the pace of the disease and treat only if those numbers are really going up in uh, you know, significant proportions over a short period of time. There are people where numbers change over a year, et cetera. That's an indolent kind of a relapse and you don't necessarily need to go ahead and treat it. And the other thing you have to ask yourself is, does a patient have high-risk features at the time of relapse? And this is where we talk about uh, the genotypic evolution. You know, and this is part of the reason why I always, you know, this is one place where teaching is really important. This is the time where, despite the fact that you guys don't like those bone marrows, get those done because it does give you more information because your disease does evolve genetically. And the more we know about the disease, I think the uh, better we are at kind of trying to take care of it. The last few questions to ask at the time of retreatment is what drugs have been used previously, because unlike other cancers, we go back to drugs you've had before also. Maybe in different combinations, but you should not say, okay, I've had Revlumid, so I'm never gonna have it again. We might use it again. We, one has to look at what kind of response you've had. One has to look at what kind of toxicities you've had that, at the time you had it initially, so that all of these can be modified going forward. So there's a bunch of factors which come into us making a decision, and that is why there's no real right answer that I can give you, because there are patient-related issues, there's issues around your myeloma, and there's issues around the treatment you've had uh, previously. I think part of the issue and part of the challenge is there's so much out there, so how do you wrap yourself uh, around what is best for me? Uh, but with that, I think Jenny mentioned something earlier this morning. You know, it's extremely difficult for most practicing oncologists to keep up to speed with all this data. There's no way that anybody can do it. And that's part of the reason why checking in with a center of expertise is really quite critical. Does not mean you have to get all your treatment there. I totally strongly believe in staying within your community and getting treatment locally because you know you have your support system in place. But being in touch with a specialist center is important because your local oncologist probably takes care of one or two myeloma patients a year, whereas a center of excellence like Little Rock, Arkansas, there's 
that's what they do for a living so they better be good at what they're doing so you know uh, that's why you need to check in with places like this the, one, the other thing i will tell you is most local oncologists appreciate the expertise of a specialist because end of the day it's not about faith gareth me or that local oncologist it is about you and all of us want the best for you. So the having that collaborative relationship is extremely important. It's helpful for you because again, we do not expect you to keep on top of all of this. Yes, these education sessions are great, but end of the day, I think you have to be able to rely on your clinical care team and they're your experts and they're the ones who are gonna guide you through this process or through this journey of myeloma. This is just a list of all the selected trials. I'm not gonna go over this, but again, point being lots of options. Obviously, we are very excited about the Polux and the Castor data. This is with daratumumab. Uh, you know, the good news is even at the time of relapse, I showed you earlier on that at the time of relapse, us finding you, uh, or us getting you into good remission is a little bit harder. Not so much anymore because in the relapse setting, we're still looking at MRD negative disease now. So the good news is we've gotten drugs where we can really cause that depth of response. And with every relapse, we can certainly get there as well. This is a snapshot data which I showed you, and I'm just showing you this one example. This is a patient of mine. This is what we look at for mutational profiling. This was the liquid biopsy he had as well. And the point uh, of making this is this guy has the BRAF mutation. It's a mutation uh, uh, which is present in melanoma patients. So 60 to 80% of melanoma patients have this mutation. And in myeloma, it's very uncommon, but it happens in about six or 7% of myeloma patients. But if you have this mutation, you can actually go on to a drug which is used by melanoma patients called vemurafenib. And we did this trial called the BASKET trial. We treated about nine patients because that's how uncommon it is. And with a single agent of this pill, we saw responses in these patients. So the treatment approach is, you know, it's pretty simple, I think. If you think about it, if you've not had an IMID, then using an IMID-based treatment would be the best. If you've not had a PI, a PI-based regimen would be best. Most patients today have had both. So then you also have, the good news is you have choices of these other PIs and the IMIDs, and you've got to try and put all of this together. There's pomalidomide where we've used. We've used daratumumab and retreatment with some of the drugs you've had is also incredibly important. So I think what we have been able to do is begin to see how all of this comes together and how we can combine all of this. And most times we are using combinations. We would love to do more personalized medicine. I don't think we are quite there as yet. But as we get more information, there are certain situations like the BRAF mutation I showed you. Yes, we have drugs against that. There's another mutation called the NRAS and the KRAS mutation, which Gareth has mentioned. And that mutation, again, we are using MEK inhibitors in those patients that they're generally doing quite well. So certain subsets of patients, yes, can benefit. By and large, the majority, we are not quite there. What's new in myeloma? Well, there's a lot of new exciting things, and that's the one thing which I want you all to go home with. There's a lot of hope, there's a lot of excitement, and there's a lot of new things. And I'm not gonna cover all of this, but this is all exciting. You've heard already about venetoclax. Venetoclax we borrowed from our lymphoma colleagues. So CLL and lymphoma patients use this. Faith showed you nicely that it works in a specific genetic subtype of this 1114 translocation. There's another drug called Selenexor. Selenexor works with a very different mechanism of uh, action. It's a nuclear export transport inhibitor, and it works quite well in myeloma. You heard nicely from um, uh, Faith about CAR T cells. This is a more uh, you know, personalized way of doing things where we take cells out from you, educate those cells and give them back to you. But all of these things are in clinical trials and because we have access to all of this, we are very hopeful that we are at a threshold for not just very long-term control, but a long, long, long-term control so that we can actually start using the word cure as well, which has still been elusive in myeloma. 
Along the way, we've worked for bone disease as well. This is the large randomized trial we've done with close to 1,700 patients where we compared denosumab, that monoclonal antibody I talked about, with zoledronic acid, and we found that both of them just work just as well when it comes to your bone disease. But what we also found, which was quite interesting to us, was like what they'd seen with zoledronic acid, we found that with denosumab, it also works against your myeloma. So we've been doing a lot of work in the lab looking at myeloma and the surrounding myeloma cells. These drugs treat the surrounding myeloma cells and anything you can do to make that soil less friendly to myeloma is going to be a good thing. And that's why we think we see this. So in general, I think what you have to be thinking about is using triplet combinations, what you haven't had earlier you use, and always and always and always think about clinical trials. But think about clinical trials if they make sense to you. You shouldn't be doing a clinical trial driving 100 miles for a clinical trial. There's a lot of different options that you have in myeloma because the critical piece with myeloma is continue to live your life. And if things are convenient and if you need them, do them. Otherwise, use what's kind of standard of care. Um, so I think what we have been able to do is combine drugs. We know that we can use them with different mechanisms of action. We also know what the high-risk subsets are. And the goals always have to be to um, you know, try and have deep and durable responses. I think continue being on continuous therapy is what we should be doing. Remember that prognostic factors are evolving. So even if some of you have some of those mutations which we think are bad risk right now, uh, I want you to go home with the view of what we thought was bad risk five years back is not bad risk anymore. And with what, how we are evolving in myeloma, it's a moving target. Again, tailor therapy for certain situations, continue to use all those bone targeted agents, exercise and live as healthy a life as possible. And that's my team at MGH, which helps take care of a bunch of my patients. Oh.